one load, and we're done. And we'll feed you lunch. So can I get it? Anybody can be here on Sunday. I'd like to have, I'd like to know who, who we got. Daryl, thank you. It really helps if you're strong. And a good back. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I got, now it's, it's gonna be really hard work for the three of us if we don't get more help. We need a little bit more. Oh, and there must be some young, strong guys out there. All right, we got Chris, Chris. thank you. Now we got, okay. Okay. Huh? You're gonna, okay, we are, so we are set. Thank you everybody so much. Okay. I, this is. Now it's uh, what, 11 days till the auction. And so I'm going to call on Tim Howland to uh, update us on what's going on and uh, tell you to start bidding. OK. So the auction is open. Now, as of Saturday, probably only half of us had managed to register. So we need to get our club membership to register up for that auction and start bidding. Bidding's been open for a couple of days. There's some great stuff, both on live and silent. So definitely get going. And if there are any donations yet, please get those in as soon as you can so we can get them up on the website and get people informed of it and start getting some bids on that stuff. Any questions? Danny, anything? Oh yeah, uh, and we do have the banquet at the Lily Market and we really need to sell a few tickets to that. So if you're interested or have somebody that you know that might be interested, prime rib or salmon dinner and open beer and wine. So come on down to the market and we'll have some fun there. Okay. And I want to thank Tim and Danny who have been doing just an amazing amount of work uh, on this thing. And uh, I think they've got it put together pretty darn well. And uh, so please support their hard work and the hard work that we do in the club by uh, signing up and start to bed. And that's all we've got for right now. Oh, no, Tim's got... Thank you, Eric. Okay, the next thing on my agenda is the Janicky Field Patrick's Playground Dedication Ceremony, and that's going to take place on August 14th. Uh, we're still in the planning stage, but we do have a band. It's a band called Midlife Crisis, who some of you may know of, uh, but they're really good, and uh, they're going to be playing from four to six. Uh, people can start arriving 2.30 on the 14th, it's a Saturday. Uh, there's gonna be a dedication ceremony at, at three o'clock. Uh, the club is gonna be providing drinks and uh, hot dogs. And I think the library is gonna have some games and other activities for the children who can't get into the uh, playground right away because it's so darn busy and overflowing. Uh, we're going to need some help setting up. It's not determined quite how many. It will help, need some help cleaning up. Uh, again, not quite determined yet, but we'll get back to you next week. Uh, next week, uh, and I think you should have all got an email, we're going to try something new and have the fifth Thursday of each month, uh, where there's the fifth Thursday of the month, Instead of having the noon meeting, we're going to be having the meeting right here, only it's going to be at 5.30 in the evening. Uh, next week, uh, the club will be providing libations, uh, whatever you'd like, to, well, not whatever you would like to drink, uh, but uh, drinks and also uh, appetizers. And what's going to be important is, is we're going to try to start planning so we can get going on what uh, we our activities or what uh, things we'd like to work on next year. So please get your ideas into me so we can have a good discussion about that uh, on the uh, 29th. Uh, the people who uh, put out the chairs have asked that 
when we stack them, please don't stack more than four or five on a pile, preferably four, and have them facing forward because it makes them a lot easier to get in and out of the back room. So if you're helping with the chairs, uh, please uh, try to do that. And finally, in, uh, Phil has brought in his recycle bucket and just leave your bottles or cans on the table and he'll pick them up after the meeting. So uh, with that, uh, does anyone else have any announcements they'd like to make? Christine. Pay your dues. Rich, I actually just want to remind everyone that I'm working on the rotary booklet. I have it with me at my seat. If you had any changes, please just go grab it, mark it up. I'm leaving early. So if you don't get it today and have any changes, please feel free to also email me. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, how about if we uh, spin and for the fortunes today. All right, we have a raffle. And welcome back, Rod. Haven't seen you for a while here. All right, first number 37. Excellent. Come on up and either. <laughs> you can either spin our wheel of misfortune or fortune, or you can take one of these prizes up front. $25 cash. Oh. Congratulations. Okay, next number, 69. Who's got it? Ah, oh, Steve Massey. A wise man. I bet you're looking there to see what go. Jan wants, right? Number 10. Number. Wayne hey, Barrett. Wayne Barrett, yeah. Will he spin or will he drink? That is the question. All right. He drank. <laughs> And last but not least, lucky number seven. Uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, congratulations. <laughs> Stay right. warm in the winter. Okay, now, is that it, Ruth? That's it. Okay, you're up. I think you're Sergeant of Arms. So who here is on Team July, the current Team July, Eric and myself. Eric, thank you for all your help today. I appreciate it. Can you collect money for me? Can you collect money for me? And then on the other end of the room, it looks like, it looks like Brock is done eating. Can you collect for me on that side? So I have a brand new member as my team captain. So she, she's still learning because, you know, we haven't been meeting in person for the last year, basically. And so for the honor of answering these questions, we're just going to go ahead and collect $2 per table because you should all know these answers so you wouldn't pay. The first question Everyone but our guests, yes. What should the Sergeant at Arms collect during the first meeting of each month? Birthdays, $3 for anniversaries that month, 
and $2 for birthdays. So if you have a new person who is doing this job as a long time member, if you're on their team, let them know that. So if you have a birthday or anniversary this month and you have not yet paid, please kick in $3 for your anniversary or $2 for your birthday. I could, I could go get my booklet, but I didn't. No, I'll be nice. You're on here later. Okay, if you plan on leaving early, what should you do for that privilege? So you're supposed to find that day's speaker who's usually sitting at the head table and let them know that you have other obligations, apologize for missing their program, and then pay the Sergeant at Arms $2 for the privilege of leaving early. Okay? All right. If you have a speaker who's interested in being our program, who should you contact? That's right, Phil Mihalik. But each month's program chair is de designated now by their team captain. So you can also reach out to the individual team captains to ask who is their program chair for their month if you have someone for a specific month. When we induct a new member, what can you do to help them know members at some of their first meetings? Introduce them, but also invite them to arrive early to the meeting to be the greeter for their first month of membership. We have gotten away from doing this because I think we've all kind of gotten rusty. <laughs> I know I have. So I think it would be great to invite some of our new members to wear the greeter badge and welcome them to be our greeter as they get inducted. Oh, look at this outstanding table. Gosh, a bunch of smart people here. When we pay fines or happy bucks during our meetings, where does that money go? To the club account for, for fun, fun for, our, for our barbecue, for our Christmas party, our golf tournament, installation, all the fun stuff, bingo. Some new members, they don't know why they're paying fines. So that's just a good little tidbit to share with them as you're bringing them in. Why are you paying for that raffle ticket? Why are you paying for a happy buck? Why are you paying for a fine? It all goes to our fun and fellowship type of events. So it's just a good way to let them know it's not just going nowhere or into someone's pocket. It's all going somewhere. <laughs> How are club officers slated each year? Anyone at this table know? I'm getting some blank stares because we have a bunch of new members or newer members at this table. Did you know that our club actually has a nomination committee headed up by Mark Nielsen? No, I didn't either until I was on the board. No one had ever really mentioned it. So just another fun little tidbit. So if you ever want to be president really bad, now you know who to bug. Mark Nielsen, wave your hand for the new members. It's right there. How do you get on the luncheon agenda to make an announcement? That's right, you can either email the president before the meeting so he knows in advance, or you can go up to him before the meeting starts and let him know. And we'll skip the head table because we only have Julia sitting there. So, but just something to keep in mind because it's been a long time since a lot of us were new members, but it's really intimidating to walk into a club and not really know the rules, right? So just keep in mind, if you see someone new sitting by you, fill them in, reach over, say, hey, this is why we do this. So they know the traditions. That's it. Thank you. Do we have any happy bucks out there? Back in the back, Brock is first up. I have a happy 20 here for Bill McCann. He is being recognized by the Washington State Bar Association for 50 years in practice. So give him a big hand.
Congratulations, Bill. So I did, I Venmo, Venmoed some money. So 39 years ago, on this day, it was a Thursday afternoon, right after the meeting, a delegation from this Rotary Club came to my family home and uh, uh, offered their condolences because my dad died the day before, 39 years ago. And they presented a plan to honor his memory. And we, we laid the foundation to establish the George C. Bricker Jr. Uh, Excellence Award. Warren Benham received the 39th award this past uh, June. So it's a really great, great way to honor his legacy. Another member of my family who sadly uh, died way too soon, Brian Gurney, uh, was 21 when he died. Uh, we honor his memory with a Gurney attorney. This year we're doing it virtually this Saturday uh, from noon to two uh, at the Gurney home. You can go to thegurneyattorney.com for information about that. We'll be back at uh, Maven Park next year. Uh, over the two tournaments, we've had we've raised over $12,000 uh, for scholarships. Uh, Cannon Jacobson received the scholarship this year from Burlington Edison High School. He's the fifth recipient. So these are two very, very uh, important, amazing men in my life that are, that are no longer with us and we honor their memory. So um, uh, I'm, I'm happy about their memory because they're a blessing to me. Anyone else? Happy bucks. Just, uh, I've got, I've got a happy 20, because David reminded me that my son, uh, who actually graduated from college, uh, got one of the uh, Bricka scholarships, and we're, I'm very pleased, and he was honored to get that. Happy $2 for the eighth annual homeless uh, uh, night fundraiser that Audrey Wool and Family Promise is putting on on September 25th, from five to seven. And uh, if I could, I have her talk just very briefly about it. Yeah, hi, I know a few faces in here, uh, Executive Director of Family Promise. We're located here in Cedar Woolley and serve homeless families with children. We've served 588 individuals through our shelter program here in Cedar Woolley uh, with an 86% success rate, which is pretty amazing. Uh, prevention, shelter, and diversion, keeping people in housing if they already have it and helping them get back into housing if they don't have it. So this event will be happening here in Cedar Woolley at Inspired Church. Uh, I think the same day as Blast from the Past. So uh, I brought some flyers with me and would love to get that out. I'd love to see all of you guys there. We're doing some raising of awareness for our youth and for adults, and then we'll have a fun concert with some testimonials afterwards. Thank you. Any other happy bucks out there? Senator Wagner. <laughs> I just didn't want to go after David because his was so heartfelt and mine is kind of trite. So um, I didn't have any Zoom meetings today and I didn't have to shave. So there's a happy 20. <laughs> Just making an announcement, eight weeks from today, very special day, it is the annual golf tournament. So put that on your calendar. Uh, we might, we're trying to spice it up a little bit, maybe have a couple other things that uh, Rich is brainstorming on. So uh, eight weeks from today, 16th. Okay, any other happy bucks? Going, going. Time for early leavers. Okay, then we'll move on into uh, our speaker. Our speaker today is uh, Nate Scott. He's the owner and a broker of Windermere Real Estate. Uh, works out of Anacortes and they have offices here in Cedar Oley. I think Becky works for, for Windermere. And uh, he's gonna give you, I think, what's a real interesting program about the market and historically and also what it is uh, today, and so I'll let Nate tell you a little bit about his background and what's going on. Thanks, Rich. Um, let me see if I can get this going. Let me.
me get the PowerPoint going. So how do I find myself standing here? I want to tell you the story real quick. Um, my dad and my brother are part of the Skagit Rotary, meets over in Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Group. Three or four weeks ago, my dad, uh, we're at a family dinner, so all the kids are there. I've also got a sister who's in our business. <clears throat> and dad asked, um, I think he was in charge of putting together the program. So he asked if the three of us would get up in front of the Skagit Rotary and kind of talk about the market. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, we could, between the three of us, put that together and make it happen. Uh, about a week ago, thank you, um, my dad, Jim, emailed us all and said, hey, you guys remember, you know, 7 a.m. Wednesday, you got to be there to speak. And uh, by the way, who's speaking? Or I actually, that's he just said, remember, you got to be there. And my response was, yep, I'll be there. Who's speaking? And it was at that point that my brother and sister informed all of us that they're both camping this week. And it's just me there. And my brother sent me a couple of graphs that had nothing to do with anything really, but basically said, it's all yours. Have at it. So thanks a lot to my brother and sister. Um, and anyway, uh, Rich was at the meeting yesterday and came up after that scattered rotary meeting and said, we don't have a speaker tomorrow. What are you doing tomorrow at noon? So that's how I got here. My name is Nate Scott. Um, along with my uh, father and brother and sister, we own a couple Windermere offices, uh, the one in Anacortes, which I manage on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, one in Mount Vernon, which is the Skagit Valley one, uh, one here in Cedar Woolley, North Cascades, and then an Arlington office. My brother actually manages the one here in Cedar Woolley. Uh, so again, he really ought to be the one that's up here talking to you, not me. Um, if you know him, please let him know that. Um, my background is I grew up in Mount Vernon. I went to Skagit Valley College and then on to Eastern Washington University. I've been a licensed realtor since 1996. In 2001, we bought the Anacortes Windermere office. And at that point, I went out there and started managing that and uh, have been there ever since. I'm also on the board of Land Title. Um, my dad started his first real estate office, only real estate office, I guess, in Mount Vernon in 1971, which is also the year I was born. So I've kind of grown up my whole life around real estate, kind of like Danny. Um, and it's been at the dinner table. And then my adult life, I've, that's the only job I've known. So it's real estate, uh, title work, and we have a, a small lending bank as well. So that's the background and the reason I'm here to talk to you about the market. Oops, there we go. Okay, so when I was thinking about what to talk to uh, the group about, you know, normally I talk to our agents. Actually, I'm gonna hit pause and I'm gonna tell you, <clears throat> on your, on your uh, tables, there's a little report, it's called the Gardner Report. Windermere has a um, full-time economist on staff. We're one of the few real estate companies out there that do that. And this guy, Matthew Gardner is his name, and I've stolen a couple of his slides that are mixed in here, but all he does is study the economy and specifically real estate every quarter. Is that better? Sorry. Every quarter he puts out a report. You're seeing quarter one of um, this year. His quarter two report will come out pretty soon. If you're interested in getting that, I'll pass around this sheet and all you do is put your name and email address on it and then you'll get that every quarter. And it's specifically, like I said, uh, Western Washington about real estate, uh, drills down even into Skagit County. And what I can promise you is you will never get an email that says, do you wanna buy this house? It's a great deal. Or do you wanna sell your house? You'll get just four reports a year from our economists that says, here's what's happening in Western Washington um, and then specifically related to real estate. So anyway, I was trying to figure out what to talk about or how to, how to describe the market um, because it is a crazy market. And this slide, I think, paints a really interesting picture and something that we've not seen as long as I've been in the business. Um, the, the two colors you're seeing here, so the light green are properties that are for sale. So right now, if you go out and look on the market, that's the number of properties that are listed for sale. And I should say that most of the slides you're going to see are Skagit County specific. There's a couple that are Washington statewide or US wide, and I'll mention those when we get to them, but everything else you're going to see is just Skagit County. So the light green are properties for sale, residential properties, and the dark green are properties that sold during that month. They changed hands, they moved on to a new owner. And so if you look in um, April, May, 
and the red lines there are showing the difference between the what's available on the market and what switched hands that month. And that is very typical. We have more properties typically on the market than actually change hands. But what happened in um, August and September of 2020 is that whole dynamic flipped. It went from having more properties on the market and for sale uh, than those that changed hands to all of a sudden we're having more properties change hands than we have on the market, active on the market. That's, that's new, that's different, that is unnatural. It's not, or it's not something we've seen before. In fact, to give you a historical look at this, uh, here's the last five years and you can see uh, the light green, the properties that are for sale are always uh, have greater numbers than those that leave the market. That is what a typical market looks, looks like. When you walk into the grocery store, there's stuff on the shelves, you buy it and walk out. Um, here's a 15 year look or back to, uh, yeah, 2006. And you can see there, um, of course, during the lead up to the, the housing bubble, there were a ton of mark, uh, properties on the market. Um, but what's consistent in Skagit County anyway, throughout time is the number that leave the market, right? Our population's only so big, though it's growing, um, but that, that difference in properties for sale that, that we saw, that flip that happened in August of last year is something that's new and uh, not something we've dealt with. And that's, that's supply and demand getting upside down. And that's what's causing the hectic pace of today's market and some of the appreciation. Um, the only time that the, the properties leaving the market kind of dipped down below that red line much was when the housing uh, bubble burst and we went through the recession and then there was the slow ramp back up to the normal activity in there. So this graph is gonna show you from 2006 to 2021, the average sales price in Skagit County. And you can see, um, you know, in 2007, when we hit the bubble, prices dropped. And then we've had that steady incline since about 2012. And what you can't see behind Becky and Aldi up there is the last uh, year or few months is just almost straight up. I mean, it's been a crazy amount of, pre of appreciation recently. So here is Washington State uh, appreciation. And this is uh, as calculated by the uh, FHFA uh, housing price index that they do every year. And thank you, Chris. Um, so one quarter appreciation in, in uh, Washington State, 4.6%. Four quarter is 15.8. Five year appreciation is 66%. And since 1991, 366%. Now, these are residential resale homes only. We'll see another graph that has a little bit different number later, um, but I'll talk to you about that at that point. So what's causing the flip in uh, supply and demand, or actually the, the flip in uh, availability of homes? One of the big things is we're not building enough. This is a uh, chart that shows um, the growth in single family home permits. So what the builders are pulling every year and Washington state up there in the, up there in the left corner, of course, 32.7% more this year than last year, but we're lagging the rest of the country. Um, we're below the average, which is why we're a yellow state. And in general, we are not keeping up at all with uh, demand in terms of new homes being built. Um, that's due to a lot of things. One of, the, one of the problems is back in the housing bubble, uh, banks found themselves holding a lot of uh, developed land and no one to sell it to. Uh, loans defaulting from builders who went out and bought them up and developed it. And banks don't want to get back in this business. They're just now starting to tip, dip their toes in it. Um, and then add on the regulations. Uh, the regulations every year increase and make it more difficult to both develop and build. And of course, we've got the lumber issue and uh, not just lumber, but all the supplies for builders right now are tough. The other thing that's causing the lack of uh, homes on the market is this. This is the average home ownership tenure. Used to be every four to five years, people would move. Uh, specifically in the early 2000s, they did. There was a lot of speculative moving there, but even uh, um, further back in history, four to five years, right in there, people move. People are no longer doing that. They're staying in their homes longer. It's up to about eight years on average. 
Uh, there's a lot more multi-generational living. Um, so there's not as many resale homes coming on the market. There are not enough new construction homes coming on the market. And then finally, another thing that is adding to this is migration. So this is uh, Washington State's net migration in, and Washington State adds 80 to 90,000 people per year, at least over the last three or four years. Um, but we're not building enough homes to keep up with that addition, and, and uh, people aren't reselling their own homes. They're deciding to stick where they are, remodel their home rather than sell. You've got the chicken and the egg problem uh, with this low inventory. If I want to sell my home, where am I going to move to? Uh, so that keeps people in, their, in um, place, and it's just all contributed to give us this inventory problem that is creating some appreciation and general um, havoc if you're a buyer. Has anyone bought a house in the last year or year and a half? Did you have multiple offers? Yes, you guys have multiple offers when you bought back there? No. You did it on the slide, that's a great way to do it. Anyone sell a home? Oh yeah, yeah, you would have had a lot of attention. Anyone sell a home? No, okay. Um, these next two maps are just because they're interesting as I was looking at the migration. Um, and this tells you where people are moving from uh, when they're coming to Skagit County. And we, we actually look at this every few years because as uh, agents, when people are asking us to market their home, sometimes they'll say, you know, I really want you to advertise this in the Chicago Tribune because I just know there's people moving from Chicago over here. There aren't, uh, the, the people are moving here. <laughs> yeah. There are people moving here from um, Whatcom, Snohomish and King County. There are a smattering around the rest of the US, but that's basically it. That's the market that you need to, to look at. And then uh, alternative uh, moving away from Skagit County, it's the same story. They're just moving to Whatcom and Snohomish. Um, and then I thought it was interesting with both maps, if you match it up to a map of the US and Naval stations, uh, there's some similarities because people moving from um, Whidbey over to Jacksonville or to Corpus Christi, San Diego. That's some of that movement right there. What do we got? Okay, so this is that first slide again, just showing you the for sale, sold, and then I've added two more lines just to kind of show you more current uh, or day-to-day -day activity, and that's the homes that go pending, so under contract, and new listings coming on the market. And that new listings line is the blue one, and it gives us some hope that there will be more, or there'll be some uh, inventory relief coming down the road. We're starting to see some of that activity. So we're, I'm hoping at some point here in the not too distant future that for sale versus sold uh, dynamic will flip back to the way it ought to be and some pressure will come off of buyers and uh, it'll be a little normal out here. So this is um, a graph we pay a lot of attention to and this is months of inventory. And what this tells you is if no one else listed a home starting today, moving forward, it tells you how long it would take us uh, as realtors to sell every home that's left on the market. And it is at a very unhealthy um, 0.7 months. So about half a month. If no one else listed something, everything would be sold in half a month. And that's not a healthy market. That's very much in favor of sellers. What you wanna see uh, to have a healthy market is somewhere between three and six months. Um, we haven't seen that for a while. It's been very much tilted in favor of the seller for a long time. We need builders to build. If you know any builders, have them build. Lots of homes. Um, the other thing that happens, of course, prices are going up. We've been talking about that. So here's the price per square foot in Skagit County. You can see that's just basically a red line heading straight up. Um, and that's due to not only the, the increase in prices of things like lumber, but also just the pressure on, on homes, on pricing. Um, and here's the median price, same story. Things are going up. That last month, which is June, I think it's 530,000 was the median sale price in Skagit County, which I think that's a little bit of an anomaly. It'll come down a little bit uh, for July's numbers, but it's still, uh, you can see what's happening in not just our community, but really across the, the states. So these are a couple um, slides I stole from our economist and he can explain them way better than I, but I'm gonna give it a stab. So this is the 
US wide now, we're not just looking at Skagit County, but US median home sale prices. And it's just basically it mimics the graph we saw in Skagit County and shows you from 1990 up to 2021. And then, so this was leading up, uh, well, this is the 90s, 45.5% average appreciation throughout the US. Um, then leading up to the bubble, and it honestly feels a lot like 2007 these days at the pace that things are, are uh, increasing in price. But leading up to that bubble, there was a period there for six or seven years that uh, appreciation rose at 68.5%. Then we had the crash and we dropped 28.6%. Uh, Did the first home buyer's home credit in there, which kind of leveled things out for a bit, but then we dropped a little more. And then comes the ramp up that we're feeling now. Uh, since 2012, we've seen 126.6% appreciation in home values. And the last, like I said, three years have been um, a big portion of that. Someone asked a question at the Skagit Rotary meeting. If you look in that last grouping there, and actually if you look at all of it, it's pretty cyclical, right? You see the same pattern over and over. Uh, but right at the end uh, in 2020 there, it doesn't do that same pattern and what and that's when COVID hit. So normally we have a peak in the in the summer and then less sales in the fourth quarter and first quarter. Well, COVID hit and it it threw everything into chaos really there. And we had one of the you know the normal good time, which would have been last summer, didn't exactly happen. Buyers and sellers hit pause when COVID came in March of last year, but then they came roaring back in this third quarter and fourth quarter. And we had one of the busiest fourth quarters we've ever had. People were buying right up until Christmas and after. So kind of threw the normal pattern um, out the door. So that was the appreciation. And then what happens if we overlay the interest rates, mortgage interest rates, this is where it kind of tells a little different story. So home prices rose by 268%, but mortgage rates dropped from 10.5 down to 3% during that same period. And what that does is it makes homes more affordable, which puts more pressure on prices. So if you have, if you look at the increases in median sale prices just nominally, so not, not adjusted for inflation, you have the 268%, but if you adjust that same graph for appreciation, um, we only raised 83.6%, so 2% a year appreciation, which is normal and good. Um, then throw in the mortgage payments. So nominally, they increased by 74.3%. If you take that exact same loan and adjust it for uh, appreciation, today it actually costs 10.7% less to own the same home. So I don't see any relief soon in terms of this appreciation because of how cheap money is. It's just gonna keep the pressure on until the Fed makes some de decisions and lo or raises the rates and cools off the market. Okay, so just a few notes about what I just talked about. So more demand than supply by a long shot. If you know a builder, have them build. Um, multiple offers on any home priced correctly. Uh, we've had homes that have, uh, you know, we're getting 10 to 15 offers on them. We had one sell in Anacortes um, um, two months ago that sold for 600000 and change over list price, which is not normal. Uh, don't let that scare you. Um, I think part of that was a problem. It was a uh, Seattle agent who listed the home and didn't understand the neighborhood, priced incorrectly, uh, but then the market also took over and bumped it up. Um, a lot of inspections are being waived for buyers. I mean, you have to find ways to compete. You're going up against cash offers a lot of the time, and it's amazing how many people are sitting out there with enough cash to buy a home. There's a ton. Um, so people are getting kind of desperate and doing things that are not recommended, such as waiving inspections, waiving um, financing contingencies, and just putting earnest money at risk and throwing everything at the wall, hoping they can get a home over their head because they're, you know, there's more buyers out there than there are sellers. Um, bulk, again, bulk of buyers are for, from King and Snohomish, not from Chicago or New York. If you're a buyer, be prepared, have your loan ready, have patience. Some amount of inventory relief is coming, we think. 
Uh, and if you're a seller, buckle up, it's gonna be interesting. Thought it was also worth mentioning, if you have rentals, uh, pay attention to changes in the law. Uh, HB 1236 and SB 5160 have passed and are both signed into law. These both have to do with landlord tenant law. Um, they have taken a lot of power away from landlords and put them in the hands of tenants. So you need to understand what the changes are if you're if you're a landlord and pay attention to them. You have to change your leases to keep up with them. If you have people on month to month leases, get them off of month to month leases, get them on six month plus leases uh, right away. And that's a time sensitive thing um, that's got to be done before the end of September, I believe, or it puts you in a bad spot as a landlord. Um, Working with tenants has just become much more difficult because of these two things. And I don't think it's the end of the rights heading towards uh, tenants versus landlords. So pay attention. If you have, uh, if you're doing your own property management, yes, sir. Get them on six months plus, six months to a year, get them off the month to month. Yeah. Um, and have your lease, last bullet point there, have your lease reviewed by an attorney to make sure it's consistent with today's landlord tenant law. The penalties are, uh, I think it's two and a half months rent plus some nominal fee, like 500 bucks to the tenant if they take it in and, and complain about it. So get your lease reviewed. Um, there's just been a, you know, these two laws are difficult for landlords. So brush up on them. I think that's all I have. We're going to skip that. Uh, there's my name, contact info. Uh, again, if you want to receive those um, gardener updates, put your email address on there and we'll send you that. We won't send you anything else. Questions? Yes, sir. They happen a lot. And uh, pretty much, I would say, anytime you're trying to buy a home where there's multiple offers, there's going to be an escalation clause involved. Um, is there a specific question about them, how they work or don't work? Boy, that's all over the board and kind of market dependent. If you're, you know, if you're buying or trying to buy a million dollar home versus a $250,000 home, the, the numbers are going to be different, but, um, basically any multiple offer situation will prob you'll probably be up against a multi or, um, escalation clause. And what I would say, if you're going to do that, uh, the advice we give is don't escalate over the competing offer by $100 uh, because it's meaningless. Really, almost all of the multiple offer deals we see, um, it is not the highest price offer that wins the home. It, it is the terms. You know, have they waived inspection? Are they all cash? Um, when, when are they asking to close and have you move out? Are they letting you rent back? So there's terms typically uh, dictate who wins, not the uh, highest price, but the price has got to be close. So if you are right in that escalation, don't, don't escalate above the other by a hundred bucks, make it something meaningful. So it overcomes any terms that might be beating you. So make it a thousand bucks or 2000 bucks, or if you're on a million dollar home, make it 10,000 bucks, you know? Um, yeah, and put your best foot forward, really. So do you recommend writing a letter to say why you want the house? How do you have a personal connection to it? Yeah, so I'll tell you, I'll give you two answers. One's from the seller seller standpoint, one's from the buyer standpoint. From the buyer standpoint, absolutely write the letter. Um, they work. Sometimes they work. I've seen people take an offer for forty thousand dollars less because of the letter, which blows my mind. I don't understand it, but you know they made that decision. If you're a seller and you're and you're in this process and you have multiple offers, and and your agent tells you they've you've got four different love letters is what they call them. Don't read them. Don't look at them. Say don't give those to me. I want to make a decision based on the numbers. And the reason for that is uh, attorneys are very fearful that we'll run into some um, legal trouble based on fair housing. Someone who didn't get it will say I sent you that love letter and you didn't take me because I was a Lutheran or you didn't take me because I belong to this protected class. So ignore those love letters. If you're a seller, if you're a buyer, write a good one. Yes, sir. What's 
Um, they are going to be in high demand. Uh, ho hopefully, you know, it's, it's a matter of the builders being able to build and having the appetite to build. Um, builder confidence has generally been up recently, so I think they will start building if they can get the resources from the banks to do it. I mean, the demand is there, it makes sense. I think if you build it, they will come from a builder standpoint. And um, the other thing I'd say about bare land is if it's already platted, you're way ahead of the game because every single year, there are more regulations or hoops you got to jump through that make it more expensive to get a, a platted piece of land that you can build on. So it, it's, it's a good spot to be if you're holding that. Any other questions? All right, thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Nate, appreciate you. Uh, it was good information, we enjoyed it, thank you. Whoops. Again, thanks, Nate, for uh, doing this on a short notice, and uh, it was a good program. Uh, I want to thank the uh, visiting Rotarian, Steve and Brandon, and uh, thank you, Audrey, for coming, and everybody remember their event for Family Promise. I'm going to try to do something new and see if it works out here, because you people have left and weren't early leavers, is I'm going to leave you with a question, and, if, and everybody that texts me or emails me before next the next meeting, which is at 5.30, remember, next uh, Thursday, uh, with the correct answer, we, names will be put in a hat for a drawing for a $25 gift certificate from Max Dales. So we'll see who does that. And uh, uh, so you don't have to get out your phones right now and give me an answer. Uh, you've got a week to get it into me. And uh, if we get enough interest, uh, we'll perhaps uh, do, it at, do it every week. Anyway, here's the question. Who is the oldest track and field athlete uh, who is on the United States team who is scheduled to complete, compete in the Summer Olympics, and how old is he? Who's the oldest US track and field athlete? What? Well, it could be a she. I said he, and that isn't how I wrote it out, so it should, could be either. Uh, but how old are they and what's their names? Text it to me or email it to me. It's in the book. I'll put your names in a hat, and uh, somebody will walk away with a gift certificate next Thursday evening at 530. Uh, with that, uh, again, thank you for our guests, and thank you for our presentation from Nate, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>